Ladies and gentlemen, today I have um, a lawyer from Russia, uh, Mr. Ruslan. Uh, Mr. Ruslan, thank you very much for joining me under the Human Rights Tree. Thank you for inviting. I appreciate it. So before we start talking about Russia and the war in uh, Ukraine, um, you don't mind uh, basically uh, telling me a little bit about uh, your background? Of course. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ruslan. Uh, originally, I'm from Russia. Currently, I don't live there. I'm abroad. So uh, I have studied for uh, four years uh, in Moscow State Academy of Law. I got my bachelor's degree over there uh, with the, like in, uh, in advocacy. I've studied in the Institute of, of Advocacy. So most of my classes were... Uh, taught by practicing lawyers and attorneys. And also I got my master's degree, my LLM in Loyola University of Chicago. Yeah, mm -hmm. I went there just after I have graduated from uh, my Moscow University. So I also, it happened during the pandemic. So I didn't, uh, had an, I didn't have an opportunity to start working in the US just after I got my LLM. So I had to go back to Russia and I was working mostly in the area of corporate law. Mm -hmm. And uh, for now I am abroad, not in the Russia and doing mostly immigration law. Okay. It's like uh, a new so, sphere for me. Yeah. Were you born in Moscow? Uh, not really. I grew up, I was born and grew up uh, in the Northern part of Russia, of European Russia. Okay. It's a Republic of Komi. It's a, a really a quiet and, uh, but at the same time, a really big place. It's mm -hmm. twice as big as Great Britain, but the po population of the whole region is less than 1 million people. It's mm -hmm. uh, quite cold, uh, but at the same time, a beautiful place because it's uh, full of forests and uh, a lot of places like uh, of nature not touched by humans. So, yeah. what, is, what is the name of the city? Uh, the name of the city is Uhta. It's like the second biggest city in the region, and the population was uh, around uh, 100,000 people. Mm. Like in comparison with other Russian cities, it's not a lot. So you were born there and you grew up uh, in that city. When, uh, did yeah. you, when did you move to uh, uh, Moscow? Yeah, when I was 12, uh, my parents got me and we moved to Moscow because my elder brother, he already lived there and uh, he was a student at the university. He was studying international economics and uh, I went, uh, I've started going to the sixth grade uh, in Moscow. So uh, for now I'm 25. So the last uh, half of my life I lived in Moscow. Yeah, so grow up. It would be uh, like more accurate to say that I grew up in Moscow because my teenage years were there. Okay. Did you grow up uh, wanted to be a lawyer or you think uh, you were guided uh, to choose that profession? Uh, I think it was mostly my decision, but I made it uh, uh, not... It was uh, like... I had a deadline maybe one year before uh, graduating from high school. Mm -hmm. I had to decide uh, what exams uh, I wanted to take. Uh, so I had to start uh, preparing. So I decided to go to the law university and I had to study like uh, Russian history, uh, mm -hmm. social sciences, English and stuff like that. Because uh, to go to legal university, you, in some universities, it can be different. Uh, you had to pass those exams, like state exams. Mm. So, and growing up as a teenager, I always uh, liked like arguing with people, uh, going to different sources, reading a lot of materials, especially mm. related to history, to politics, to news. Uh, and I thought uh, like legal profession would be best perfect for me, at least at that moment. Okay. Uh, how was it uh, going to school? in Moscow and studying law? Mm. Uh, it was great, I would say, but uh, <laughs> uh, some professors uh, were uh, really professional, were uh, really nice. They 
told us a lot about like uh, real practice, not only uh, like uh, university classes and books, but they would come uh, to the classes uh, just from their offices and would tell us stories like of real uh, implementation of law, how it would be in real life. But some other professors would be just professors. They would uh, be the people who dedicated their lives to just teaching, but not practicing law. So it was quite of mixed experience, but uh, a lot of my classmates were also really, uh, were people from different backgrounds, from different parts of the country. And we were all together in all this. So it was quite interesting to be surrounded by a lot of new people. Because it shall be noted that uh, in Russia, in comparison with the other European universities, uh, you visit most of the classes with the same like 15, 20 people, with the same group of people. So if you like those people, it would be uh, like really great, uh, amazing four years of studying because you would be uh, study with your friends. But in case you don't like those people, it would be hell, <laughs> yeah. I think. So as you know, we have different families of law. You, know, you have the common law, you have the Greco-Roman. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, the Russian laws belong to which family? Uh, it belongs to European, uh, like continental European family of law. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of, um, I think, references, at least uh, studying during my first year, we have studied Roman law, like the basics of Roman law, and some basics of uh, German and French law. So mm -hmm. I think uh, modern Russian law, especially after the collapse of Soviet Union, the civil law was so really had a great influence uh, from French codes, from German codes, mm -hmm. I would say. So how do you, um, basically, if you, um, we talk about the constitution, the Russian mm -hmm. constitution, how can you de de uh, describe uh, the state of Russia right now? Is it a republic? Is it a federation? Uh, how can uh, you... Um, at least on paper, yeah. At least on paper, uh, Russia is a republic. Uh, the president is elected. Uh, it's a federation of uh, uh, like internationally recognized uh, 83 regions. It shall be noted yet yeah, that not all the regions that are recognized as, as Russian territory inside of Russia are recognized uh, as those uh, internationally, because we understand that uh, nowadays uh, the war is going on, and uh, some regions uh, that Russian government declares are part of Russia, they are not. And so some of them are included in the Russian constitution as parts of Russia. So it is different if you uh, read the Russian constitution like uh, in original in Russian or in English translation, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, modern Russia, uh, I would say it's, of course, everybody understands, I think, it's an authoritarian state. So a lot of uh, paragraphs of constitution there can sound great, uh, quite liberal, but uh, in real life, uh, when law is implemented, it's a really different, you have a really different outcome, especially where when you have to face uh, court hearings in Russian court. Yeah. So how can you explain uh, that dynamic? In one way, uh, you're saying uh, they are beautiful laws. Your constitution reflect uh, uh, the principle of freedom and liberty. But when you come to the application, um, it, it doesn't work like the laws. How can you explain that contradiction? Yeah, it's not the first time something well, like this. Yeah. yeah, it's not the first time something like this is happening because uh, during the first year of uh, legal university, of law university, we were studying like the history of Russian law, of Russian empire, of Soviet Union, of modern Russia, and uh, constitution of 1930s, the USSR constitution under Stalin. It was quite liberal as well. And uh, especially at that moment, a lot of countries uh, couldn't have such laws in their uh, constitutions, in their legal systems, and Soviet Union had. But at the same time, we all know that uh, the Soviet Union in 1930s were a really horrible place. Uh, 
in in the matter of human rights and human rights violations. And uh, I think nowadays something like that is happening because uh, the Russian government is ruled by people of like, uh, they are called baby boomers. They uh, were born after the end of World War II. They grew up in the, I would say, in the wealthiest years of Soviet Union. They had their young years, like their teenage years, their uh, university years. So they have quite a nostalgia about the Soviet times. And they are trying to bring back as, uh, m- as much stuff from Soviet times as they can. So like declaring all those uh, amazing uh, like liberties, uh, put them in paper, in laws, uh, it's one thing, but uh, the real implementation, how the system is really working in modern Putin's Russia, it's different because uh, uh, sometimes when they want to, they can uh, adopt new laws that elaborate on some paragraphs of constitution, but uh, most of such laws, they contradict the constitution itself and the constitutional court, most of the times, it would just say that, uh, like, the constitution is so brief and so uncertain, and the law, uh, which would contradict it, <laughs> it's just an elaboration, and you should refer to the law, not to the original text of constitution. So that's just a, a really simple explanation. But uh, I'm pretty sure uh, if we have listeners from other uh, countries of we of western europe or from central asia maybe from middle east of southwest asia they would understand what i'm talking about like uh, pretty well so what is the process of adopting laws um if you're saying for instance the law will contradict the constitution um i mean i mean by that how what are the different steps a law take to be approved by uh, the assembly uh here it's uh, like and nothing I think new. It's the duma right yeah it's uh duma is a lower chamber also we have a council of federation it's okay. the upper chamber uh it would be equivalent of uh, us senate because they are like uh, uh two representatives from each russian region uh, in the and uh, in reality, what we have like this uh, Council of Federation, it's usually just uh, a place where uh, most uh, like uh, really old politicians uh, mm-hmm. or really old deputies from Duma would go just to have their like senior years to spend their time, get uh, a salary on or do anything because uh, not a lot of people, they uh, even know that there is an upper chamber in Russia because uh, usually when you read the news about an adoption of a new law, you always hear that state Duma like adopted something. But also all the laws in Russia, they have to be approved by the upper chamber and then they would be signed by the president. Putin, but at the same time, he can uh, put a veto. So what are the plate. different branches for it here? We have the legislative branch, the executive branch is the judiciary. In in Russia, what are the different branches you have? Uh, they're the same. So in constitution, you can see that there are like three different branches. The constitution declares that they are independent of uh, one another. Like uh, we have the judicial branch uh, that has like, of course, a high court and we have a separate constitutional court. Uh, so they would be, be like uh, two separate things, high or Supreme Court, as you, if you prefer, and constitutional court. Also, we would have an executive branch and the legislative branch and the legislative branch would consist of two chambers. And the president is not a part of an executive branch. He is uh, somewhat something like separate. Uh, in in practice, he would be like the head of executive branch because uh, he is a, a person who is assigning all the ministers, all the heads of the ministries. But uh, the constitution doesn't recognize him as a head of executive branch. Also, we have uh, like the uh, bodies of prosecution. 
they are not really a part of executive branch as far as I understand, but uh, constitution doesn't uh, declare them like uh, some like fourth branch. They're also somewhere there. Who is the head of the executive branch? Uh, it would be a prime minister. There is a prime minister in Russia, of course, and mm -hmm. uh, 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 it's not a really important uh, position, I would say, especially nowadays. But uh, if you know some, like the history of modern Russia a little bit, you can remember that from uh, 2008 till 2012, uh, Putin was a prime minister because uh, like in accordance with the Russian constitution, with the literal interpretation of the text, you cannot be a president uh, more than two terms in a row. So after two terms uh, serving as a president, uh, there should be another president. And after him, you can be elected again. That's not what the authors of the constitution intended to be. But uh, during Putin's era, a lot of uh, ideas were uh, really misinterpreted from their original uh, view. So what, what is in the judiciary? What is the highest court? Uh, it would be the Supreme Court of Russian Federation, I think, mm -hmm. because the Constitutional Court, it has uh, some limited uh, abilities. Uh, it, mo it can uh, check uh, like the, con the constitutional constitutionality. Sorry, I'm not sure it's a real word, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, it the is. Consti constitutionality of uh, different laws and mm -hmm. sometimes uh, they not of only like laws being adopted but mostly of existing laws because there, are, there were some cases uh, where like in criminal cases uh, it, yeah it's, it would be usual for some criminal cases where people uh, that were uh, refused or of some like basic uh, rights related to criminal cases, for example, for their representatives or stuff like that, that they would uh, reach the constitutional court and get this right because the constitutional court would say that uh, they got an illegal refusal and the law is unconstitutional. So... Uh, uh, it was uh, a common practice, like in two thousands, I would mm. say. So the judge, the judge at the Supreme Court, are they nominated or they are elected? Uh, I I have to mention that I'm not like an expert in constitutional law, and uh, there is a possibility I missed some changes. But as far as I remember, they are uh, nominated, and most of them. I think uh, are assigned by the president. So uh, yeah, it shall be noted that uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the constitution declares uh, all the branches are separate and independent, uh, the president has a lot of uh, abilities uh, to assign people, not only the ministers, but the judges uh, as well, as far as I remember. So, but we have to, acknowledge that the president is not elected, is it? Uh, the president of the, the Russian Prime Federation? The minister is elected. Do you, and the president is elected too, or? Uh, the prime minister uh, is elected. He is usually assigned, assigned. Assigned? To, yeah, and the president is elected, but uh, I don't, it's hard to say like he's really elected because uh, we all understand that uh, like in modern Russia, there is no such thing as fair elections. So, okay. but he is so, elected, yeah. Right now, if I have an understanding, Putin is the prime minister. Or he's a president. He's, he's a the president. president. He okay. was a prime minister uh, starting 2008. Okay. And uh, he finished his term as a prime minister in 2012. Mm -hmm. Then he got uh, re-elected. Okay, so the president is elected and the, the prime president minister is, elected. is nominated. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. so how is the legisl legislative branch divided? So the legislative branch uh, is divided into two chambers. The upper chamber is a council of federation and mm -hmm. the lower chamber is the state Duma. Mm -hmm. uh, the state Duma... Uh, it's usually uh, also elected, 
and uh, there is uh, uh, like half of the uh, deputies in the state Duma. They are elected by uh, uh, like majority. So there is uh, you would if you live in a certain region, like in certain district in Russia, uh, you would. Uh, give you cast your vote for a certain candidate that would become a deputy in the duma during the elections but at the same time other half of the deputies in state duma they would be uh, elected by the lists so usually when you go to the state duma elections in russia you have two uh, you have two pieces of paper one includes a list of these districts uh, like candidates and another one uh, includes a list of uh, political parties so you give your vote uh, for a candidate for a certain candidate for a certain party and for the party and uh, you don't have to give your vote for the party and from a candidate from the same party it can be different okay so if for instance uh the russia wanna go to war mm -hmm. what is the process of approving that we know in the united states uh the congress have you know the power to declare war mm -hmm. and approve but in russia is it the the legislative branch that approve war or is the president that decide well we want to go to war and we're going to war in a perfect scenario uh the president has to ask the as far as i remember it's council of federation the upper chamber uh for uh, approval uh, to use the military abroad abroad but uh here is the difference uh putin didn't declare war with the U ukraine he declared uh, a special military operation so uh like as they don't recognize it as a war they uh, so they don't apply the wartime laws to mm -hmm. to everything that's happening right now at least not the laws that should be applied so for a special military operation uh, the president doesn't have to go to the duma and the council of representatives correct true true they don't ha he doesn't have to go there is it the case uh mostly yes uh frankly speaking i uh, haven't checked all the military laws uh, like that are uh, currently adopted in russia but uh yeah that that's the case because okay. as far as i remember uh at least 7 years ago putin got the approval from the council of federation to use the military in syria Okay. Uh, when when during my first year uh, of uh, law university, I remember a lot of news about Russian military in Syria fighting ISIS, and not only that, but uh, nowadays it didn't happen because it would be also really suspicious because he wanted uh, to start this war by surprise. Okay, so what is the meaning, legal meaning of uh, special military operation? based on uh, Putin? Uh, based on Putin, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think it shall be noted that uh, nowadays in Russia, a lot of stuff that is declared by president, by his representatives, is not really consistent with the law, with the like spirit of law, with the constitution. So uh, the day he started the, the war, he said uh, he in his uh, uh, TV speech that this especially military operation against the, as he called it, a Nazi regime in Kiev, in Ukraine. So it's uh, the operation to stop the militarization of Ukraine and uh, to prevent uh, like the Kiev regime from killing people in Donbass region. That's what he said. Okay. But but that's nothing to do this has nothing to do with the real law it's just it was a silly excuse he made uh during the first day of war because uh, at least for now everybody understands that he was planning to finish this war like in a week or so 
But, okay. And after that, uh, the purpose of military operation, it uh, it was changing and changing. So nowadays, they, are, they tell there are like completely different reasons. Okay, so we know in the month of February 2022, um, Russia started uh, a special uh, military operation in Ukraine. And mm -hmm. today we call it the war in Ukraine. So mm -hmm. at the beginning of the war, uh, um, what was the mood in Russia? Um, if you can, can you describe us what was the mood even before the war? Uh, even before the war, frankly mm -hmm. speaking, uh, uh, neither my friends nor me, we couldn't believe that something like that can happen because we we knew the country we were living in at least we thought so and we thought it uh, was mostly just bargaining tool like to put all those troops near the border it was like a bargaining tool with the nato and uh, putin was just trying to scare everybody but we couldn't even believe something like that can happen so the first day uh, like february 24th we all got really surprised okay so most of the uh, country was surprised that putin attacked ukraine yeah because i remember me and my co-workers uh more i think the whole day like of february 24th we were mostly just checking the news mm -hmm. and uh, at the workplace uh, there was no like atmosphere no environment to work and a lot of our uh, like colleagues a lot of our counterparties uh, on different projects they weren't even like writing us emails as it would usually happen during most of their uh, days because like i worked uh, in quite a big firm it's always like each day consists of a constant uh, <laughs> writing of emails to one another and that day at least on my level of uh, like uh, junior associates, junior lawyers, I don't remember something like that happening uh, mm -hmm. because nobody understood what's going to happen, uh, whether the circumstances, the environment of uh, law, of uh, financial institutions, of uh, like international trade, how severely would it be damaged or how would it change? Nobody understood anything. Everybody was just waiting and reading the news. Okay, so when um, Putin went on uh, to start the special operation, what was the reaction of in Russia? Was it a divided reaction, or you you all were caught by surprise? Uh, we were all caught by surprise, but uh, it's sad to acknowledge it. But some people would uh, support it. Yeah, that's awful. But mm -hmm. uh, Russian propaganda made a lot of efforts, especially during last eight years, to like make a lot of people believe that uh, Ukraine is a enemy and uh, it's like a criminal regime, and uh, that Russian uh, troops are trying to prevent some greater war. So that's why they are going to Ukraine. At least that was the narrative of Russian propaganda, but uh, I don't I don't really know any people like uh, my friends, my relatives. I don't have such people who would support all this mess because that's just horrible. Some people go uh, to protests, but uh, at that moment, uh, a lot of like political activists they would be. Uh, already imprisoned or they would be out of the country working from abroad so a lot of people just like common folks they would go to the central squares in their cities but uh, in russia uh, on each protester that would be like two three four policemen uh, in whole equipment they would be called like uh, cosmonauts like because they have all these huge helmets and mm -hmm. uh, really huge batons they would use to beat people. So all the protests during those days, they would uh, end in mass uh, arrests, detentions, and uh, some people would be tortured at police departments. It didn't happen in one evening, but uh, people still try to protest in Russia nowadays. 
like some people, but uh, uh, most of people, they just understood that they would get uh, huge prison sentences. So what was the voice of people protesting? What was they uh, claiming? Uh, they were claiming just to stop it, to finish, to retrieve from Ukraine, to stop it. Uh, some people would just go against the war. Like, I, I don't want anybody to die i want to support uh, like peace and stuff like that uh, some other people they would just start instantly supporting ukrainian army because uh, some people would understand that uh, there is no retrieval of russian military from ukraine and the only thing that can stop like uh, the whole country uh, from uh, like the literally uh, state of ukraine from uh, devastation it's ukrainian army the mm -hmm. only obstacle between putin and uh, kiev but what was uh, we know there was people protesting the mm -hmm. war because they didn't want russia to go to ukraine but as you acknowledge it uh, there was also people who were supporting uh, uh, president putin on his war based on the fact um he's the 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 narrative he's making is he's protecting minority Russian minority in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He's going against um, a fascist regime based on him. So, what is the voice of those people? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it shall be also noted that a lot of uh, uh, rallies that are uh, in support of uh, Putin and his regime. Mm -hmm. uh, like usually if you see the image of uh, mass rallies in support of the regime in mm -hmm. Russia from Russian news, uh, most of the time that are people working in governmental institutions that are brought to those rallies. Mm -hmm. They work uh, like uh, in uh, different branches, uh, mostly in, in different offices and departments of executive branch. So they are brought uh, to those rallies during the work time or uh, so they cannot uh, just not go because they would be, uh, it would be a violation of their employment contracts because mm -hmm. their employers, the government would uh, consider that they are uh, just, uh, excuse me. Yeah. So they are just uh, not visiting their workplace. It would be considered as that. So a lot of people would just go to those rallies. Uh, so there would be a picture of uh, mass support. And after that, the, they would just go home because a lot of people in Russia, they are uh, quite scared to do something uh, oppositional. And they just want uh, everybody, especially the government, to leave them alone. They just want to, they, it's easier for them to go through all those procedures and just go home to to their back to their lives than to start uh, complaining with their employers because it also would uh, uh, it would also bring some uh, like uh, negative consequences to them. Mm. Okay, so, uh, so we only we have a few minutes uh, left. I think this is going to be our first conversation, and mm -hmm. I the next time we we get together, I will talk about more about the war and the sanctions and their mm -hmm. effect in, in Russia and pursue the conversation. Uh, Ruslan, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to have an insight uh, on the situation of Russia right now and the, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And I will look forward to uh, continuing the conversation mm -hmm. and to learn more about what's going on. So what is your last word for this session? You can share uh, with the audience. Yeah, uh, firstly, uh, one more time, thank you for inviting. And uh, for all the listeners, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, everything I've just mentioned here, it was uh, quite brief. And uh, mm -hmm. if you want to learn everything uh, about this complicated topic mm -hmm. uh, and all those like uh, subtopics as a uh, war as Russian law, as Russian propaganda, as uh, 
uh, about uh, Russian opposition, about different people trying to protest, about like Russian politicians imprisoned or Russian politicians working from abroad. I suggest you go and read not only uh, and try to read. Of course, you cannot read uh, if you don't speak Russian, all those like sources of information. But uh, I'm just suggesting you to try to uh, read not only like Western news, by, but uh, try to find some uh, Russian sources, not the not Russian sources from Russia, not like Russia today, of course, but uh, something uh, from Russian investigative agencies or some Russian uh, opposition writing from uh, Europe, because I think most of their uh, like huge articles can be also found in English. Some of them are trying to translate them, as far as I understand, at least uh, such good things as the... Uh, like Nova Gazeta, new newspaper, they have like an English version of some of their best investigations and articles. Uh, recently, uh, their uh, chief editor got, uh, I think it was a Nobel Prize or, uh, sorry, I, I, I can't remember properly, but uh, it was some huge acknowledgement as well. Uh, also some uh, other good sources would be the Insider, it's a good community of some uh, investigators. So just try to find uh, as much information as you can and you would understand the topic. Okay, again, Excellent. thank you. I basically think we, I hope we come up with a solution to a peaceful um, a solution on what is going on right now between Ukraine and Russia. Again, I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you, bye, see you. Bye.